Lord, we're thankful for the fact we can uh, have this class, and I pray you'd help us uh, as we uh, study the uh, historical evidences for um, the New Testament, specifically the Gospels here, that you would strengthen me as I teach. I pray that it'd be a blessing to the students in the class and those that can watch the video as well. We just commit it to you. And we pray also for uh, people skeptical of Scripture that would watch this, that they would um, consider whether or not what they think is actually based on the facts. And you pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay, so uh, we're going to be looking at the, some historical evidence for the New Testament here. Uh, we're going to be on the Gospels for a little while here. And so why does it matter whether or not there's evidence for the New Testament? Um, well, what do you think? Why would it make any difference whether we have evidence for it or not? Why does it matter whether there's any evidence? I mean, you know, maybe, let, let's say that the... It proves beyond a reasonable doubt that it existed. Okay, sure. It, it gives evidence that it's true uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. Sure. That's, that's a pretty good reason. I mean, God wants us to love... Believers should love God with their minds. And so we, as we understand the evidence for uh, his word, that is part of loving him with our mind. Um, also, we sh can explain this to others. It's actually not intellectually reasonable for people to reject the Bible, including the New Testament, as we're looking at here. And uh, we're, we should be able to uh, explain why that is, and people who don't think that it's true should be able to see that they need to change that. Um, I remember we, my wife and I were on a plane, and there was this person sitting there with us, and he said, I just, I just tried trying to witness. He said, I believe what I see, you know. And so I, this, this book that I'm working on, on the archaeology, I had it on my computer. So I pulled out, gave him all the stuff. You, know, you can see this, you can see this, boom, 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 boom. He's like, oh, wow. Okay, I see it. It's true. It was great. He didn't uh, come to Christ that day, but he was, you know, much closer. And he saw that there's, it's, there's reasons to believe the Bible because there are. There's great reasons. And he, you know, had never heard that before. So those are some, some good reasons. And he never saw it up until then. Yeah, he'd never seen it. Yeah, he never seen it and got to see it. What a blessing. Praise the Lord. Amen. Does evidence, historical evidence, make the Bible true? No. No. It's true. Let's say, we, let's say we, before archaeology dug up anything, it was just as true as it is now. Okay, when God speaks, it's true. And his word is self-attesting. Okay, so historical evidence doesn't make it true, but it gives its great confirmation of what is already true. And uh, people who aren't willing, uh, who think that they have uh, intellectual justification for not believing the Bible, you know, we can see that that is, is not the case. Um, also, looking at some of the history helps us to understand the world and the background to the New Testament. Okay, so we can kind of get a better sense. Like, for example, it's kind of like if you go to visit Israel, you, everything's kind of is lit up a little bit more when you get to see where these things are and stuff like that. Uh, you know, we, um, we'll see. If, what we can do maybe is if somebody comes to class late, each day you come late, it's one person's ticket to Israel. Okay? Let's <laughs> so see if we can, we can get, to, uh, get everybody to go by the end. No, but, uh, you know, just like you, if you go and you physically see these see these places and see things, you get a better sense of what's going on. Studying these things helps us to understand uh, the, the New Testament better as well. Uh, so those are a few reasons. Any other reasons that come to your mind right at the moment? You know, like uh, yeah. So, yeah. I see a lot of people raising their hands. Why? Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. So... Oh, every part. this is every time we're having class. It's a party. This is this is. Uh, you don't live by bread alone, and you definitely don't live by. You live shorter by pizza alone, I guess, than by bread, <laughs> right? But all right. Anyway, so those are a few reasons and um, why this is valuable. And another reason I think it's good to look at some of this archaeological stuff is many Christians don't know, and we really should. It's it's the right thing to know. You can uh, graduate from some Bible colleges and never take a class in archaeology or any evidence for the New Testament. And, you know, I guess maybe if your major is, you know, I don't know, 
typing or something. Maybe it's not in there, but, but you know, this would be a good thing for people, people to know about. So we have the videos going up for the Old Testament, the archaeology Old Testament, um, and now you know, here we are looking at the New Testament. So very good stuff. Okay, let's talk about the Gospels. What does the word gospel mean? Good news means good news. The Gospels are good news about Christ's, uh, what he did, his death and his resurrection from the grave. So we have four Gospels. What are the four Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, yeah. And Thomas, right? Gospel of Thomas? No. Q? Okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Aquinas, yeah, Gospel of Aquinas. Yeah, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Da Vinci Code, right? Um, now, who wrote Matthew's Gospel? Matthew. You think Matthew wrote it? Yeah, okay. Not everybody thinks that. We're going to see why Matthew did write it. How about Mark? Who wrote Mark? Mark, okay. And Luke wrote Luke. John wrote John. Do you know who wrote the book of Acts? Wasn't Paul. a guy named Acts? No, it wasn't Paul. Paul didn't write Acts. Who wrote Acts? Luke. Luke, Luke wrote Acts. Acts is the second part of the book of Luke, if you look at Acts 1 and following. Now, Luke was actually Paul's traveling companion, so Paul actually influenced you know, Luke and Acts, but Luke wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. Now, um, Luke did. Luke wrote Acts. If you look at Luke 1, 1 and following, he said, he's writing to Theophilus, and it's the second part. Acts is the second part of the Gospel of Luke. So basically, Acts is conti uh, continued. The Gospel of Luke is Christ's deeds when he's on earth, and the book of Acts is really Christ's deeds after his ascension. And so it's the second part. So, we're going to uh, look at Matthew here first, because Matthew is the first uh, gospel written by Matthew. Uh, Matthew 9.9 9 here has the call of Matthew. It says, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. Now, the receipt of custom. So, Matthew is a tax collector, Okay. And just like today, tax collectors were not very popular, right? Now, Matthew wrote his gospel. Does anybody know when Matthew was written? What year? Matthew is written approximately, what is it? 45. 45, says. What do you think? Do you like 45? Or who thinks? Earlier? No, 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 I take it back. Later? Oh, she takes it back? Okay. She doesn't. Okay, doesn't know. We'll go with 45. Go with 45? Okay. All right. Go with 45. She's brold. You know, gave it an answer. Uh, there's good reasons to conclude Matthews are in about 40, actually. About 80, 40. Uh, so not, not too far away. We're going to look at some of those reasons in a little bit. And so Christ died and rose again in AD 33. So Matthew is very close to the time that um, Christ died and rose again. Now, Matthew's gospel was probably composed in Jerusalem, or very close to Jerusalem. Christ's earliest followers, were they Jews? Were they Swedes? Were they, you know, what were they? Because earliest followers, you know, South American Indians, I mean, <laughs> what were they? Mormons, right? They were Jews, right, they were Jews. They were Catholic, no, I, I, no they were Catholic, were in the wrong church, right? Yeah, so they were Jews, they were Jews, okay? And you can see that Acts 1 through 7, for example. And Matthew's gospel emphasizes the Lord Jesus' character as the Messianic king of the Jews. So, for example, the one predicted in the Old Testament, the Messiah, the anointed one who would be the redeemer and the ultimate ruling king. So, for example, here you have references to him being king of the Jews. Matthew 2, 2, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. So the wise men were wise. They came to worship Jesus. It doesn't say there were three of them. It doesn't say they did on December 25, but there were, however many there were, probably a, a significant entourage. They came to uh, worship uh, the Messiah. Which uh, shows, of course, as well, that they recognized the deity of Christ worshiping him. No. If you think about it, I mean, 
if you have three people with gold and frankincense and myrrh, the, the, the reason they say the three is they brought three gifts, but bringing three gifts doesn't prove there's three people. And if you're gonna go all that distance, you're gonna have a big entourage. I mean, you're gonna want protection. These are important officials. So they're, and when they actually came to Jerusalem and asked Herod what's going on, they, they kind of caused a stir. What's going on here? So yeah, there would have been more than three. Uh, but I think it's actually just, this is not the main point here, but it is interesting that they, and it doesn't say they went to the stable either. Um, they were living at a house. So they didn't go to the stable. They uh, were staying at a, at a house at the time. Uh, and it's interesting, even though they were not very far away from Jerusalem, it uh, looks like most of the people in Jerusalem didn't come with them, right? They, they just didn't care enough. So anyway, so king of the Jews, Ephesus, Matthew 2.2. 2. Possibly they knew mis- prophecies about the Messiah from the book of Daniel, which was written you know, out that direction. Matthew 21.5, here as Christ comes into Jerusalem and says, Tell you the daughter of Zion, behold thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and the colt the foal of an ass. So here uh, the Messiah is coming in, uh, fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. Matthew 27, 29, 37, and 42. They put a crown of thorns on him. So this is a little bit different type of king, isn't it? They put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. So they knew what, you know, that's what he was, that's what he was. And he set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. In other words, get off the cross, don't do what God sent you to do, and then we'll believe you. If you do what God sent you to do, we won't. <laughs> but so, king of the Jews, clearly an emphasis here. And then the Great Commission, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power, all authority is given unto me, heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So he has all authority, and he's with the church to the end of the world. That's a promise of church for perpetuity at the end of his gospel. So king of the Jews, emphasis in the Old Testament, on the gospel of Matthew, rather. Definite emphasis. Now, what evidence do we have for Matthew writing the gospel of Matthew and for its date? Well, we have very, very strong historical evidence. So Matthew's authorship of the gospel bearing his name receives overwhelming support from the extant historical sources. So... Uh, in fact, uh, the testimony to Matthew writing Matthew's gospel is unanimous. We don't have anybody who lived back then who said Matthew didn't write it. They all said Matthew wrote it. Now today, if you go to a secular university, they're going to tell you Matthew didn't write it. But everybody who lived back then thought he did. And they actually could investigate it and look into this a lot better than somebody who's living you know, 1,900 years later. right? So uh, the people who lived back then said he wrote it. Everybody did Nobody did, said anybody else did it. Now, it's, now, if you are, go to an anti-supernaturalist uh, person and ask about the Matthew's gospel, it's going to be anonymous. We don't know who wrote it. some community. And we'll try to make it as late as possible. Because the primary reason... Okay, Matthew, we're, we're talking about the dates of the Gospels, and we'll, we're going to get into this a little bit later, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke, at least, they want to push them after AD 70. If you deny the possibility of miracles, and you deny that there is anything supernatural, you really want to date the Gospels after 70, because in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Christ predicts the destruction of Jerusalem. If these Gospels were written before 70, there's predictive prophecy in the Bible. That's a no-no. That's miraculous. We can't have that going on. I mean, Jerusalem wasn't destroyed every day. It only happened 586 B.C. and 70. So if Christ can predict this and predict the destruction of the temple, there's predictive prophecy in the Bible. That's unacceptable. So let's get it after 70. That's kind of the situation. If Matthew wrote it, then this is going to be accurate. I mean, this is one of the 12 closest people to the Lord Jesus we might actually have to pay attention to this thing. <laughs> if it's by some anonymous whoever who is passing on oral traditions from this person and that person and blah, 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 then we can say it's made up and we don't need to listen to it and we get to keep doing whatever we want to do. So that's what we want to get if we're anti-supernaturalist. Anonymous, late, we get to ignore it, discard it. 
And the dominant view we're going to see is actually that the dominant view today is kind of this evolutionary paradigm is that in anti-supernaturalism is that Mark was the first gospel and Matthew and Luke copied Mark and they also had this document called Q. And we'll talk about Q later, but that's the dominant view <coughs> of how this came about. And so Matthew kind of took Q and he took Mark and he took another source which doesn't exist called M and he kind of put them all together and here we go, Matthew. And it wasn't written by Matthew. So yeah, so that's the, that's the view. And if you get a liberal commentary on Matthew, it's going to tell you this is what happened. But as I mentioned here, what the people who actually lived back then, nobody said it was anonymous. Nobody said anybody else wrote it. They all said Matthew wrote it. So if we actually go on what we have in terms of evidence, it's going to be Matthew. So for example, R.T. France in his commentary on Matthew said, attribution of the gospel to Matthew the apostle goes back to our earliest surviving patristic testimonies. What does patristic mean? Pater. What pater means? Pater. Patristic. Father, yeah. The church fathers. Okay. Our earliest surviving patristic testimonies. And there is no evidence that any other author was ever proposed. It's pretty strong. Not that, you know, it's 75% say it's Matthew, 25% say it's anonymous, 10% you know, say it was somebody else. Everybody says it was Matthew. As far back as we can trace it, and from the earliest manuscript attributions that have survived, it is always the gospel caught on Matthian, according to Matthew. So in other words, at the top of the gospels, when they copy them, the manuscripts say at the top, according to Matthew. Okay? And um, there's no other heading. They all say according to Matthew. If it was just some anonymous people, and they just say, well, let's make some deal. Let's say, you know, Matthew. What do you think? Yeah, Matthew. You know, you'd think that different people make up different things if they're just making it up, but they all say Matthew. So that's, that's very strong. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah, if you're going to just make it up, you're going to have one person say it was Matthew, one person say it was Andrew, one person say it was Peter. You're going to have a mix, but there isn't a mix. It's all Matthew. So why would that be? Because Matthew wrote it. <laughs> so let's see what the uh, patristic testimonies are. <coughs> First one is Papias. Papias. You ever heard of Papias before? Yeah? No? Well, now you have. You have. You just heard of one right now, right? Paper. No, yeah, no, yeah, paper and Papias. Not, probably not, no. Paper and Papias. I don't think, I mean, you might, might have used uh, papyrus as paper, so you might have written on, on papyrus. Papias was born approximately AD 60. Okay, so he was born about AD 60. He had direct contact with eyewitnesses of the Lord Jesus' earthly ministry. So Irenaeus, another patristic writer, who's a little bit later, says Papias was the hearer of John the Apostle. So he says Papias heard John preach. Okay. So Papias heard John. Other writers say that as well. Papias, uh, Wenham says uh, in his book on dating the, the gospel, says Papias emphasizes that he got his information from those who had known the apostles Andrew, Philip, Thomas, James, John, Matthew, and others, and is writing self-consciously as a particularly well-informed person who had multiple sources, and who was only removed from Matthew himself by a single link. Thus he had informants of great reliability whose reports his readers could safely trust, testimony of the highest quality. And Papias, in addition to the apostle John, so he was familiar with people who knew them, and also, he personally had heard John the Apostle preach. And he was also familiar with a man named Ariston, who was, or Aristion, who was one of the 72 that Christ sent out when he sent out these people to preach. So he was familiar with a lot of people. Born about AD 60. He wrote a book called, five volumes, called Exposition of the Oracles of the Lord. It was a five-volume book he wrote, or five-volume set. And he wrote that around the end of the first century. And uh, this book, we don't have you know, copies of the whole thing. We only have fragments preserved in quotations by other writers. But it still is a pretty early testimony. I mean, this is a book expo exp uh, you know, talking about this stuff written about the end of the first century. And so uh, in his book, in uh, Papias said, Matthew composed the gospel. 
So about the end of the first century, pretty early testimony here, Matthew wrote the gospel. That's what Papias said. We also have Irenaeus. <coughs> Irenaeus, a little bit later, said Matthew also issued a written gospel. So another early writer in Christendom. Origen. Among the four Gospels, which are the only indisputable ones in the Church of God under heaven, the first one was written by Matthew, who was once a publican, tax collector, but afterwards an apostle of Jesus Christ, and it was prepared for the converts from Judaism. So that's what he said, who wrote it. Uh, Origen uh, believed some things that were pretty strange, but he was very intelligent, very scholarly. Uh, this, this quotation from Origen is from his commentary in Matthew, Volume 1. In Irenaeus, we have his writings. You can find these quotes if you get a set of the early uh, church fathers or patristic writers. Eusebius, early church historian, said Matthew committed his gospel to writing. So Eusebius, Matthew wrote the gospel. Uh, the longer quotation is, he said, Matthew, who had first preached to the Hebrews, when he was about to go to other peoples, committed his gospel to writing and thus compensated those whom he was obliged to leave for the loss of his presence. So he, Eusebius says he went somewhere else, and before he did, he wrote the gospel down. Jerome. Uh, Matthew the tax collector was also named Levi. If you look at Luke 5.27, Levi was, is, uh, he had a Greek name and a Jewish name. Published a gospel in Judea, chiefly for the sake of those from the Jews who had believed in Jesus. So we have, uh, those are just examples of the early testimonies to Matthew's gospel. That's from Jerome's commentary on Matthew. Some anti-supernaturalists try to say, well, you know what? These other patristic writers, they were all just copying Papias. They didn't care about who did it. They just said, well, Papias said so, so let's believe what he said. But there is no justification for that. For example, Irenaeus, the, the different people, Irenaeus, uh, all these other people that we mentioned, they were uh, sc scholars in their own right who had information from widespread and independent sources. I mean, you know, they think this is the word of God. They're not just going to believe some guy and, and not just not investigate it. They're going to look at, into this very carefully. Uh, they didn't need to rely solely on Papias. And, for example, in the writings of Irenaeus, there's no hint of dependence on Papias. He didn't say, I am just depending on Papias here. Doesn't say it. So he would have had his own independent sources. He was sufficiently close to the authorities of Papias to have his own information. So we have multiple. These are not just one guy's testimony repeated by other people. This is, these are de independent testimonies to Matthew writing Matthew. So, so uh, thus, the Matthew who occupies a place in all the lists of the apostles of the New Testament is the only person who has ever been regarded as the writer of the gospel which bears his name. This name. So, does that sound like a pretty good reason to believe it? I believe it. Think so? Yeah. Absolutely. Only in the 18th century AD did anti-Bible skeptics begin to question Matthew's authorship. So, Unanimous until 18th century here. And was it, do you think it was because they all of a sudden found all this new evidence that said they, you know, they did, were doing a lot of archaeology then in you know, 1812, and they said, you know what? Matthew didn't write it. We just found this ancient source that said he didn't write it. Do you think that's what happened? No. They just wanted to be skeptical. They wanted to deny Matthew wrote it, and so they said that he did. And they didn't have any new evidence. They just said... They rejected all the ancient evidence uh, because that helps you undermine scripture. So all the people who actually lived back then said Matthew wrote Matthew, which means you know this is going to be one of his close followers. Uh, we talked about the headings of the manuscripts. Oh, that book by the Redating Matthew, Mark, and Luke by John Wenham. It's a very good book on the dates. It's good, good information on the dates of the Gospels and so on. Wenham is an English, English scholar. Uh, he, now, anyway, so he pointed out there is complete unanimity in their attribution of authorship in the manuscripts uh, over the four titles of the Gospels and a distribution extending throughout the whole of the Roman Empire. 
So just like, so this thing with all the headings saying Matthew, Kata Mathion, according to Matthew, before they copy Matthew, that's also true for Mark, Luke, and John. You don't have copies of manuscripts of Mark that say at the top, you know, according to Ricky, okay? There aren't any copies like that, according to Joseph Smith, right? Uh, it's all Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Nobody else for all four canonical Gospels. And that is actually, if I say, what is the, what do the words apographa and pseudepigrapha mean? Or what are the apographa? What are the pseudepigrapha? Well, in the Old Testament, the Apocrypha are books that are non-inspired that the Roman Catholic Church decided to add to the Bible. Okay, So there's a specific set of books that are apocryphal for the Old Testament. For the New Testament, they didn't add, the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church didn't add any books to the Bible. Um, like they did. And it actually took them a long time to do that. They only added the Old Testament Apocrypha at the time of the Reformation. And it was kind of a statement to say, we're over the Bible. We can decide what the books are. So we're going to here we go. And it helped them get some other extra biblical doctrines in too. But some believe that that's okay. Especially if you're Catholic, they feel like oh, yeah. the authority to do so. Exactly. If you're Catholic, they can add books to the Bible, and that's fine. And that was part of their argument with the Protestants. We that's get to do this. Yeah. Let's add it in. Now, for the New Testament, there are no apocryphal books for the Old Testament. All right? So, and pseudo, what does the word pseudo mean? False. False. Yeah. Pseudo. So the su graphe is to write. So the pseudepigrapha are false writings. Okay, they're uninspired books that are fakes, like the Gospel of Peter. Okay, this is an uninspired writing. Some heretical people, second, third century, wanted to make up their own book, pretend that Peter wrote it, and they put Peter as the author. Okay, that's a pseudepigraphical book, false writing. So there are these books that are much later than the canonical Gospels where Gnostics and other people decided to try to pass them off as early, pass them off as authoritative, and they, these are called the pseudepigrapha. And you can find you know, copies of these writings out there. They're not nearly as well-preserved as the Bible, but you can find, you know, find them in English and read them if you feel like it. They're pretty weird, weird stuff. But so they, those are the, the uh, pseudepigrapha. Yeah, the pseudepigrapha. And, the, and for the New Testament, apographa and pseudepigrapha are kind of the same because there's not like. In the Old Testament, pseudepigrapha would be books that even the Catholic Church didn't add in that somebody made up. Well, apographa are the ones they specifically add in. For the New Testament, it's kind of just they're both rejected writings that are not inspired. Now, do um, you have a question? So what is, what's the, um, what's the other Catholic writings that they have? Um, what's them? Apocrypha? No, not Apocrypha, but the... Um, I mean, they have a lot of, they wrote a lot of stuff, but the only thing they added to the Bible is the Apocrypha. That's the only thing the Roman Catholic Church added to the Bible. And actually, the Apocryphal books, while they're not inspired in the Old Testament, they are actually worth reading. If you've never read the Old Testament Apocrypha, don't stop reading the Bible to read it, but it is worth reading. It has some valuable history, even though it's not God's word. Like, like 1 Maccabees records, yeah, that's, that's in the Apocrypha. That's actually one of the books. It, it's the time uh, when, when Antiochus Epiphanes destroyed the temple, and, and it's very interesting reading, even though it's not infallible. They, they, some believe that that's actually gospel. I mean, yeah, yeah. If you're a Roman Catholic, you have to believe that is scripture. Yeah. Even though in the Apocrypha, it actually says there's no prophets, at this time, so that kind of means it's not inspired. <laughs> There's no prophets. So it actually says it's not inspired, but they say it is. Oh, well. But anyway, um, the point here, you know, this is New Testament, now, not Old Testament, but the pseudepigraphical writings, their headings are not unified like the canonical Gospels. Canonical Gospels say at the top, according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. Pseudepigraphical ones, Big mess who they say wrote it because they didn't write it. The book is also called The Apocalypse of Moses or The Life of Adam and Eve. So Apocalypsis Moses or Wita Adai et Ay. Um, it's, it's the same book. What's it about? You know, I don't remember right now what it's about. 
um, probably has all those people in it. Um, there's another one called the Proto Evangelium of James. It's supposed to be like James supposedly wrote it, but that also has mo many, many different titles. So, and they just picked one and just say, well, let's just call it this, okay? If you get a modern edition of the New Testament pseudepigrapha, you can read about the Proto Evangelium of James, you can read about the Apocalypse of Moses or whatever. But these books have different titles because Moses didn't write it, James didn't write it. So it was anonymous. Some anonymous person who was trying to pass it off wrote it, so they just picked different people to say that they made it up. So if the gospels had, if the canonical gospels had been anonymous, this is what would have happened with them too. Somebody would have picked Peter, somebody would have picked you know, whoever, and they would have had all these different titles, like the pseudepigraphical ones do. The canonical ones don't. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everybody says that. These ones do because these people didn't write it. And so they just pick different people to make it up. So it's quite a contrast. When people say that Constantine just pick, people say very foolish things. When, if they say that you know, the Roman Catholic Church just picked the books of the Bible in the fourth century just to hit their, meet their politics, they don't know what they're talking about. That is total garbage. Um, we can see that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were accepted as canonical from the very beginning. These ones weren't. It wasn't like, well, let's go with Matthew over the Proto-Evangelium of James. You know? No. It was obvious. Yeah, well, that's a total lie. That is totally false. Uh, it cannot be justified. Um, <coughs> yeah, no, there's definitely some ignorance and problematic situation. So we can see the canonical Gospels are recognized immediately as the product of their authors, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Uh, under inspiration. Here's a quote here from Wenham. The circulation of individual Gospels without titles for even a few years would have resulted in the invention of a diversity of titles. As soon as more than one Gospel was in use in a church, some method of distinguishing them would have had to be devised. Let's say you had, two, let's say you had a Matthew's Gospel and Mark's Gospel. If there was no titles on them, you know, and, 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 you know, the, the preacher wants to preach from in one of them. Well, which one's he going to, you know, get me the gospel. Which one? Uh, you're going to have to call them something. Okay? So, these t as soon as any church has more than one gospel, they have to have the titles at the top to distinguish them. The unanimity that in fact exists cannot have been imposed by authority. So, in other words, it couldn't have been the Roman Catholic Church telling them this is who the titles are. Because in the second century... You know, you're, you're getting persecuted. You're running away. Okay, there's nobody. The Roman Empire couldn't care less who wrote these, okay? There's no authority that's telling you, you say that this is who wrote it. Nobody's doing that. So the unanimity, the unanimity that in fact exists can't have been imposed by authority, for no authority existed capable of affecting such imposition throughout the world by churches. Nobody was able to tell the people in Spain and in Jerusalem and in Persia to put the same title on these things. So how then did it come about? Well, the attribution of authorship to Mark and Matthew brings us into the period when the Gospels were composed with the Gospel according to so-and-so terminology. It's actually rooted in Mark 1.1. In Mark 1.1 it says, um, I'll just read Mark 1.1. This is actually where this, this title thing comes from, the according to Mark. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So there are that's basically the title to Mark's gospel. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ is like the title of Mark's gospel. And so this terminology, the gospel according to so-and-so, is kind of rooted in this, uh, this verse. So from the day of the publication of a second gospel, they would have been known as the gospel according to Matthew and the gospel according to Mark. And the practice would have been extended in the publication of Luke and John. In other words, the tradition of authorship, which was followed with such unanimity, could well have been transmitted without a break from the time of the publication of the second gospel, or even earlier, as soon as, as, soon as Matthew wrote it, he could have put it at the top. But at least from the time you had two gospels, you have to have this, these titles on there. So this is very strong evidence for the traditional um, authorship. Also, pseudepigraphy was universally condemned and rejected. And that's not to say that people didn't try to make fake books and say that they were real. But nobody was accepting a book they knew was a fake. Okay, so it wasn't like, 
well, Matthew didn't really write this, but we kind of like it. We're going to say it's canonical. They didn't do that. Uh, if they, any time it was known this is a fake, you know, this is this gospel according to Peter. Peter didn't write this. This thing is not canonical. No. Um, so that was the attitude that they had. Um, no one ever seems to have accepted a document as religiously and philosophically prescriptive, which is known to be forged. I do not know a single example. So stuff that was, you need to live by this, they didn't say it was fine to forge it. Pseudepigraphy was, in other words, uh, you have some people, you have some people say, you know, some anti-supernaturalists who want to say, well, you know, they were forging it and they were just wicked people. These, they were liars pretending it was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But you have other people who say, well, you know, they weren't liars. They were just, they were good people and they just pretending that it was writing to Matt, really Matthew wrote it and they were just pretending. But, you know, it was, they, other people thought it was okay. Well, we know that Matthew didn't write this. This is okay. You can't do that. Um, they would have had to been very bad people or, you know, forging these things. So, for example, Serapion, uh, an early uh, Christian, said, For we brothers receive both Peter and the other apostles as Christ, but pseudepigrapha in their name we reject. So, uh, writings from the apostles, we receive them like Christ himself we receive. Pseudepigrapha, get that junk out of here. No way. Carson, in his um, New Testament introduction, says, but so far as the ancient evidence goes, when they explicitly evaluated a work for its authenticity, canonicity, or for its authenticity, canonicity and pseudonymity prove mutually exclusive. If it's canonical, it's not pseudonymous. It's pseudonymous, it's not canonical. The difficulty is the lack of evidence that the New Testament Christians gave any countenance to the idea. So nobody thought it was fine. Uh, if somebody wrote an epistle saying Paul wrote this, if they realized Paul didn't write it, that thing's out. So they didn't accept um, things that were fake into the canon. So today, when anti-supernaturalists say, well, you know, Matthew didn't write Matthew, Paul didn't write some of his epistles, you know, John didn't write John, that is not something they would have accepted, and there's no ancient evidence for that. It's just their assumptions. What reasons do we have specific? So Matthew wrote Matthew, all right? Matthew wrote Matthew. Why do we say about AD 40? It's a very early date. And it's actually sad, even the influence of anti-supernaturalist theories is such that some evangelical people, more than we would like, even some professedly fundamentalist people, don't even consider the actual ancient evidence for the dates. They just kind of assume later dates because, you know, their liberal professor where they got their PhD told them so. So, must be so. So, what are the reasons for these dates? Numbers of reasons. First reason we're going to mention here, James. I guess you wrote the book of James. Think it's James? Think so? Was it pseudonymous? No? Okay, James. Yeah, James. James wrote James about 45 AD. All right? Yeah, that's, James is one of the earliest, earliest New Testament books. Why is James so far back in the Bible? Well, the order of the books is not necessarily the order in which they are written. I mean, we have the order of the books. You have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John first. Then you have Acts, the early church. Then you have Paul's epistles, Romans up, to, up through Hebrews. And then you have the other authors. You know, we have James. Who put the books together in the Bible? In, in that order? Well, yeah, I guess the order we have today. You know, that, that's a good question. I'm not sure when. I mean, obviously, if you're doing writing stuff out by hand, having an individual whole Bible is going to be I mean, it, if you're writing it all out by hand, it's going to be a lot of work, <laughs> okay? So, yeah. Yeah, James is very early. Yeah, but they, they, the order, I'm not sure, I don't uh, know exactly. That's a good question. You should look in to see uh, off the top of the head when uh, that order, having Gospels and Acts, then Paul's Epistles and the other ones, that, that's a good question. But, yeah, it, the date of the, the books are written is not necessarily... In the Old Testament, too. I mean, Moses' books are very early, of course. But, you know, if you, go, you keep going through, there's some psalms that are earlier and some psalms that are later. You know, David wrote a lot of them, and Asaph wrote some. You know, and um, so the other books also, there's grouped different ways. But James is very early. 
and James has shows a knowledge of Matthew's gospel. There's over 35 parallel passages with Matthew's gospel. So if James is written about 45, then Matthew would have been earlier. Let's go ahead and let's look at a few of those. So um, maybe we can go around. Um, Ricky, do you want to get Matthew 5, 34 to 37? And you can get James 5, 12. You can get Matthew 6, 19. And Brother Myers, you can get James 5, 2. I'll get Matthew 6, 24. Heather, you can get James 4, 4. And there's more than those, more where that all came from. So yeah, you can read it when you... Is it 34? 34 to 37. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these, one of Okay, so that's Matthew 5, 34 to 37. Don't swear. And what does James 5, 12 say? <coughs> but above all things, my brethren, swear not. What sounds like? Neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest you fall into condemnation. Yep, so it sounds like he is, you know, sounds like Matthew. Uh, Matthew six nineteen. Um, yeah, that was yours. That was yours. Yep, yeah, Matthew 6.19. Oh, yeah, 6.19. That's okay. Lay up not for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust uh, dust corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. All right, good. James 5.2. So, sounds like he's alluding to that there. All right, Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Okay, James 4, 4. The adulterers and adulteresses will be not the friendship of the world. All right, good. And there's more of those. Uh, like I said, there's about 35, approximately. So it looks like he is aware of Matthew's gospel. About 35 of those. And a few more examples, like Matthew 7, 1, James 4, 11, and 12. I'll just look at that one too, Matthew. And that will be enough of those. So judge not that you be not judged. The world's favorite verse, but it, what it means is very good in context. Speak not evil one another, brethren. He that speaketh evil his brother, judgeth his brother. Speak the evil of the law, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who art thou that judgest one another? And we keep going. So, uh, that's one reason. Also, the earliest post-biblical writings of Christendom contain quotations from allu and allusions to Matthew's scripture, which would show the gospel existed. You can't really quote for something unless it's already existed. Try it sometime. Okay, you can't do it, right? So, uh, the Epistle of Barnabas, uh, First Clement, the letters of Ignatius and Polycarp and the Didache are some early Christian writings. The Didache has been dated by, for example, a John A.T. Robertson in his book, Date Redating the New Testament, Dated the Didache has been dated as early as 80, 40 to 60, potentially. Might be a little bit later than that, but possibly. First Clement has been dated approximately 70 AD. Uh, Epistle of Barnabas about 80, 75. And those writings uh, have references, quotations from allusions to Matthew, Scripture, so that Matthew had to exist because these people are quoting it as Scripture. So the writings that we have up here, King James came from the text of the Septuagint, is that what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, that, that, yeah, that just, yeah, the, the, what I have up here, this is accordance Bible software. So I just have the English here and you have the Greek on the other, yeah, that's Greek on the other side. But, yeah, so uh, First Clement, 
uh, we don't know who wrote the Didache. That just means teaching. The Epistle of Barnabas was not written by the Barnabas of the New Testament. First Clement uh, was actually written by the third pastor of the church at Rome. That's who wrote First Clement. So quite an early book. If you read First Clement, it's a very interesting read. Clement is writing to the church at Corinth. And guess what? The church of Corinth was still having problems with being divided. <laughs> so just like when Paul wrote to him, they were still having problems with it. Just telling, hey, you've got to be unified, guys. Uh, but it looks like, uh, he looks like an independent Baptist, First Clement does. He doesn't look like a Catholic. He talks about the churches are independent. Um, there's no hierarchy. Justification is by faith. Um, the word church, the body of Christ is the local assembly, not some universal thing. Um, so Clement, he looks like an independent Baptist, First Clement does. Um, even though you can also see Clement is inspired. Like he uses an example of the resurrection, he uses the Sphinx. Now the Sphinx, there is no Sphinx, okay? But they thought there was a Sphinx back then, so he uses that example of what resurrection is like, the Sphinx dying and coming back to life. So, you know, it's not inspired, because he didn't know, right? He's just a good man writing to the Church of Corinth. But um, it, there are these quotations from Matthew in there. So, so it's actually receptive. Yeah, yeah. The King James translated from the text, the Greek text for Septus, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, those early writings. Now, Clement, there is a Clement mentioned in the book of Philippians. <clears throat> you know, Clement also, my fellow, Paul's fellow laborers, Clement here. Now, Origen, Eusebius, Epiphanius, and Jerome say that the Clement of Philippians 4.3, Paul's fellow laborer, was for the guy who wrote First Clement, the author of the book we call First Clement. Um, if they're correct, we don't know that they're correct for sure, but if they're correct, that would also show that First Clement's pretty early too, because he had to be alive you know, at this point, and he was still alive when Clement, First Clement was written. So that's worth throwing in there. So then when they, so in other words, <coughs> King James came from 1611, that's when it was completed from the Texas Receptus. I'm sorry, I know what it's like. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit different. Yeah, the King James was translated in 1611 from uh, the type of Greek text that was received. Yeah, okay. that's true, yeah. So Clement here, uh, very possibly the author of 1 Clement, and um, you know, another early book quotes Matthew. So about Matthew here, we have these early citations. We also have internal evidence within Matthew supporting a date after the resurrection of Christ, of course. I mean, obviously, it had to be written after the resurrection. Matthew wasn't written before the resurrection because it talks about the resurrection. So it wasn't written in the first century BC, okay? Uh, so obviously, after the resurrection, but it was not later than 70. Matthew, remember, is written to the Jews. Matthew very frequently has these fulfillment formulas. Like when Christ fulfills prophecy, he says this. Christ did this to fulfill what was written here. Christ did this to fulfill what was written there. He does that over and over again. Just like just as an example, Matthew 1, 22, all this was done to fulfill Isaiah 7, 14, a virgin shall be with child. So he records the virgin birth and said, look, this fulfills what the Old Testament says. Christ being from coming out of Egypt, uh, the flight to Egypt comes out. Well, that fulfills Hosea 11. Out of Egypt have I called my son. Um, the uh, Herod slaying of the children of Bethlehem fulfills what Jeremiah says. Uh, here, well, there's the Great Lamentation. Matthew does that over and over and over again, records these fulfillment citations. Matthew 1, 22, 2, 15, 17, 23, 4, 14, 8, 17, 12, 17, 13, 14, 35, 21, 4, 24, 34, 26, 54, 56, 27, 9, 35. A lot of them. Okay. So a lot of these fulfillment citations. Now, Remember, Christ had predicted the destruction of Jerusalem. If Matt, and, that, and that was, at least in the first century, that, that was an earth-shaking event. I mean, having the Jerusalem temple destroyed, if you're a Jew, this is huge, right? Jerusalem being destroyed, this is huge. This is like the center of everything to you. If Matthew had been written after 70 AD, and Christ had predicted this was going to happen for rejecting him, what would Matthew have with all these fulfillment formulas he has, what would he have put in there? Yeah, he would have mentioned somewhere this prophecy Christ made was fulfilled. You would expect a fulfillment formula if Matthew was written after 70. I mean, this was, Christ predicted this way ahead of time, 40 years ahead of time. Look, man, he predicted the future. And you rejected him, and look what happened. 
just like he predicted, fulfillment formula. So, um, but there wasn't one because he wrote before. So internal evidence for that. And in fact, uh, and this is probably the last we're going to wrap up here. Look at Ma Matthew 10 and verse 2. This is quite interesting. Matthew 10, 2. We're going to have to use, you're going to have to use a little grammar here. See, I don't know no grammar. Okay. Well, you have to try. Grammar? What's grammar? <laughs> Matthew 10 and verse 2. That's the next one. Grammar? Bible Institute. I N C I. Okay, anyway. Matthew 10 2. It says, now the names of the 12 apostles, what's the next word? Are these, the first Simon is called Peter, Andrew his brother, and he gives the names of the 12. Now, in the book of Acts, we had somebody who got martyred very early. One of the 12 apostles. You remember who it was? James. Right, James gets martyred very early in the book of Acts. James is martyred in AD 42. It would make sense for Matthew to say the name of the 12 apostles were these, but he's writing before James is dead. James is still alive as well as the other 11 when Matthew's writing. So he says the names of the 12 apostles are these, because all 12 of them are still alive. If you look at Mark and Luke, Wait, what was James what? 42. That's a different James than the author of the book of James. Um, but the apostle James is martyred in AD 42. He says here the names of the 12 apostles are these, because they're all still alive. Mark and Luke, when they record the names of the 12 apostles, they use a past tense because they are written after one of them was dead. Matthew was written before he was dead. So it says R. So that's good internal evidence um, for uh, the fact that he wrote before the death of James. So who wrote the book of James? James, the brother of Jesus, wrote the book of James. Not the apostle. Remember? Okay. Some of these names are common, like Mary. How many Marys are there in the, in the New Testament? A lot, a lot of Marys. And Mary was the most common lady's name in the first century Palestine. A whole bunch of Marys. Mary this, Mary that. Jesus wrote the book of James, the brother of Jesus, wrote the book of, of James. Okay. And ja James, the, uh, one of the twelve apostles, James, son of Alphaeus, wrote, was one of the twelve. Different James. So, anyway, um, those are some evidences for that. We'll look at some more evidence for the date of Matthew. Um, we'll get into that some more next time, Lord willing. Any comments, questions about, about that? So to sum that up, what, why is this stuff valuable? Well, we, we, all the reasons to help us share truth with un, un, unsafe people. You know, it, it helps us understand the world of the Bible um, and many other reasons. Uh, Matthew wrote Matthew. We saw lots of evidence for that. Everybody who lived back then said he wrote it. Um, there's no, the manuscript headings say he wrote it. There's no disagreement like there is with pseudepigraphical writings. When, what year was Matthew written? About AD 40. We've seen early quotations. James, um, about 30 sometimes. Um, also, uh, this internal evidence here, writing before 70 because the temple hasn't been destroyed yet. And we're going to see some more, Lord willing, next class. All right, well, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Lord, we're thankful for the opportunity to look at these things. I pray that you would strengthen uh, believers through the truths as we look at them, that they would be encouraged in the reliability of your uh, infallible word and that the reason that this is absolutely intellectually credible. And I pray that you also help uh, people watching the video, uh, if they are skeptical of scripture, to think whether they need to re-examine their position and that you'd also encourage uh, believers that are watching it to... Um, realize that there's every reason in the world to uh, receive your word as what it is, your own uh, infallible uh, testimony from heaven. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.